Welcome back, lecture 23 today. We are in the middle of the chain rule. We took a look at three different ways yesterday of kind of looking at the <coughs> chain rule or, or trying to help us remember how the chain rule works. And we did one example problem all the way through and we were in the middle, kind of near the end of another one, although we need to be able to simplify it. Um, this happened to me yesterday, sometimes you say, well, when would there ever be a graph that is shaped that way? Um, I know this is white paper, and if you could kind of come in on that. This is a, is a graph, and, you know, teachers always make these graphs of something that looks like this and comes up to this cusp and then comes back down, and you say, well, when would anything ever really look like that? Um, I had some hearing tests done yesterday because I've been having some uh, pain in my left ear. And this is actually when they put pressure on your eardrum, this is how it's supposed to look. So this shows how your eardrum reacts to the pressure. And then when they release the pressure, this is how it's supposed to look. So this is, this was actually my right ear, which was responding correctly. Um, she didn't give me a printout of the left ear, but I can tell you it did not look like this because um, I'm battling an infection and I've got a little fluid in my ear, but it looked way different than this. So when would anything ever look like this? Here's something <coughs> that looks like that is the results of, of the way an eardrum should react to pressure. And then once you release the pressure, how it should go. Something I'm sure you wanted to know, but I had her do me a printout because, you know, I'm just kind of a math nerd. Um, at the end of class today, we kind of tabled this diagram yesterday. There is a limit problem on the web assignment, which is due tonight, right? So we'll try to get this at the end of class to a point where I think you can take it from there and answer. This is uh, as theta, which is this angle goes to zero, obviously from the right because it can't go to zero from the left. You can't use negative numbers for theta. Uh, we want to compare the area of this semicircle, use your imagination on my diagram there, uh, compared to the area of this triangle. So we do want area functions in terms of theta. So we'll come back to that hopefully uh, the last part of class. We did an example yesterday. Uh, let's get it, our answer into a better form than we left it yesterday because we were running out of time. <coughs> Isn't this the final problem we did yesterday? And we were asked to find y prime. So we decided it was a chain rule problem. I'll go through the parts kind of quickly that we did yesterday, and then we'll slow down when we get to a point where we're doing something new and different. Um, exponent times the same inside function to one degree less times the derivative of that inside function, which is a quotient, right? Denominator times derivative of numerator minus numerator times derivative of denominator all over denominator squared. Now, did we get further than that? <coughs> That's exactly where we stopped? Yeah. Okay. So especially when you're putting an answer into WebAssign, you're probably going to have to simplify this just a little bit more. Uh, kind of planning ahead for the simplification, I'm going to go ahead and call that x minus 1 to the fourth over 2x plus 3 to the fourth. Uh, let's see what we get here. We get 2x plus 3. Everything that follows is subtracted minus 2x. There's a minus 2, and it gets subtracted, so that's plus 2. <coughs> so the 2x minus 2x, so it looks like a 5. Is that correct? Over 2x plus 3 squared. So there's the part that we didn't get to yesterday. So if we're simplifying completely, putting like terms together, our lead coefficient would now be 25. Takes care of the 5 times the 5. Uh, looks like we've also got an x minus 1 to the 4th 
in the numerator and what in the denominator? Next. To the sixth, is that right? So we've got this thing times this thing, multiplication of two things which have a like base, so you can add the exponents. So that is probably how WebAssign would be expecting an answer. All terms simplified and like terms put together. Question on that? Procedure or algebra involved in that? All right, next example problem that um, puts us in a position to use the chain rule. Trying to just look at some varied problems. This is a product, actually a fairly ugly product. We, we do have a choice. I don't think you'll like the alternative, and that is to square 3x minus 1. That's not bad. Uh, here's a trinomial raised to the fourth. I don't think we even want to talk about raising that to the fourth. <coughs> and then when we're done multiplying every term by 3x minus 1, the quantity squared. So you could expand and then use the power rule. A lot of wasted effort there. So what we have is a term, even though it's kind of an ugly term, and it's raised to a power times this other term. So we can use the product rule first times derivative of second plus second times derivative of first. Is that proper start? with the product rule. This is a step that a lot of times I'm writing down in class that you can avoid writing that down. You can go ahead and take the derivative of this and take the derivative of this and avoid this intermediate step. That's fine. So here's where the chain rule comes into play. To take the derivative of the second piece of the product it forces us to use the chain rule, right? Unless we want to do all kinds of cumbersome work. So what's the derivative of that second piece of the product? Four to the third times eight x plus one. So this underlying portion is the derivative of that second part of the product. Is that okay? <coughs> Plus the second times the derivative of the first. Same rule, same chain rule, a little bit easier this time. How does that go? To the first times three. So there's a chain rule on that derivative, which is the derivative of the first piece of the product. <coughs> so what probably needs to happen from this point, if we're going to use this in any way, we've got two terms. There's one, there's the other, they're added together. Is there anything that's present in both expressions that we could factor out in front? Four. <coughs> both four have a four x squared. squared plus x minus five. To the third. Here it's to the third, here it's to the fourth, so we can at least bring it out to the third. What else? Three x minus one. They both have a three x minus one. To this has it to the first, this has it to the second, so they both have at least to the first. Anything else that we could factor out in front? Any monomials? Two. A two? Okay. This has a four and this has a two. So we could factor out a two. 
I mean, there are a lot of other things that we could factor out, but we'd kind of like to get the problem right. So we'll just factor out the ones that actually work. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I've seen lots of other things factored out from problems like this, but they're not right. So what's left in that first expression after we factor these three things out? Three Got a 3x minus, three X minus one. 1. We have a 2 mm -hmm. and an 8x plus 1. Is that it? Okay, and after we factor these three things out of the second expression, <coughs> what's left? Got one of those, 4x squared plus x minus 5, because we factored it out to the third and we had it to the fourth. This we factored out, this we factored out, the three didn't quite get factored out. So unless it's ridiculously cumbersome inside the brackets after we factor everything out, then we probably should simplify. It's, it's not that bad in here. Uh, let's see what we have. We have a 12x squared plus 3x minus 15, right? That's the second piece. The first piece, we're going to have um, 24x squared, and that's going to get doubled, right? 48x squared. Uh, middle term would be minus 8x plus 3x <coughs> minus 5x. No, yes. And then that gets doubled. Is that correct? Minus 10x. And then the um, constant would be minus 1, but it gets doubled, so it's minus 2. And then we'll put things together that we can. 48x squared plus 12x squared, 60, minus 7x, minus 17, does that work, as long as all that arithmetic was done properly? Do you see an advantage of this form compared to this one? <clears throat> Any potential advantage? What if you were setting the derivative equal to zero, which is something we do, right? To see where the horizontal, the tangent lines are horizontal. <coughs> I'd much rather set this equal to zero than set this equal to zero, because to set this equal to zero, I'd probably <coughs> get it in this form first. Because if you set something equal to zero and it's already in product form, can't you set each term of that product equal to zero? So I think there are some advantages. Uh, it probably would be a little bit quicker if you were evaluating the derivative at a certain number. Let's say at x equals 1, it'd probably be easier in this form as well. So it's easier to set equal to zero. It's easier to evaluate it at a specific x value. So it, it is a little um, more useful in this form than it is in this form. Questions on any process there? So I realize that it does you absolutely no good that I know how to do this problem. So that's why I ask for your input when we do problems. Um, I want you to feel confident that when you leave, you can do this problem. Is that the case with this problem? Okay. Now, we've looked at the chain rule in terms of <coughs> kind of the outside function and the inside function. This doesn't really have a so-called inside and outside. It's got kind of an upper function. But treat it like you would any problem. If you were doing this problem, you would say to yourself, what do I do first when I plug in a number? Well, the first thing you do is the inside function, right? You would double the number you're putting in and then subtract 5. So there's the inside function. And then what would you do last after you doubled your x value and subtracted 5? 
then you'd raise that to the fourth, right? So there's your kind of first function and your second function. First function being inside function, second function being outside function. Use that same approach here. If you were putting in a value for x, what's the first thing you would do? You'd take the cosine of it, and then after you took the cosine of it, what would you do second? You'd raise e to that power. So cosine of x becomes like the inside function, right? That's the first thing you do. And then e raising e to that power is the second thing you do. So don't we take the derivative of the outside function first? Is that correct? Yeah. So we're taking the derivative of e to some power. To this point in time, what has been the derivative of e to some variable power? E, e, to, e to that same power, right? And now we then focus our attention on the inside function, which is really not inside. It's kind of upper function here. Now we have to take the derivative of the cosine of x. What this problem kind of establishes is a <laughs> shortcut for e to any variable power. We knew coming into this problem that if we started with e to the x, the derivative was itself e to the x. Now we're basically adding this. We have e to some variable power, but it's not just x. Let's call it u it would be e to the u, just like we did right here, followed up with what? The derivative of u. So that's kind of a chain rule version of exponential differentiation. <coughs> so e to the cosine of x, nothing to do with that except just write it down. That's part of the answer. Derivative of cosine of x? So you could kind of reshuffle things, put the negative sign out in front, but you're not going to simplify that very much. A couple of examples that um, we skipped yesterday. Let's go back and pick them up. I mentioned something about them, and then I just, I don't know, we just went over them. I didn't, didn't do anything about it, so let's go back and pick those up. We've got some squaring here and taking the tangent of something here and here, in both functions, squaring and tangent. What's the first thing you do to the variable quantity here? Square it. You would square it, and the second thing would be take the tangent of it. Isn't that different than this expression? In fact, if this bothers you where that squared symbol is, it's really the tangent of x, the quantity squared, right? That's what that means. So what's the first <coughs> thing you would do here? Take the tangent of x, and when you're done taking the tangent of x, you would square the result. So same things going <coughs> on at different times. First thing here is squaring. That's the second thing here. Second thing here is to take the tangent. That's the first thing here. So that should approach, or we should approach, the chain rule differently because of the way things are done in a different order. So isn't this function really the tangent of something? And this function is something squared? So what's the derivative of the tangent of something? secant squared of that same something, right? So we took the derivative of the outside function. The outside function, or the second function, is the tangent. Derivative of tangent of something is secant squared. We follow that up with the derivative of the inside function, which is 2x. Now, I would probably want to rewrite this because it might be a little confusing to look at that answer in that form. Is it the secant squared of x squared times 2x, or the secant squared of x squared, that whole thing, times 2x? The second thing I said, right? 
So you might want to bring the 2x out in front <laughs> to avoid confusion. Sometimes we want intentional ambiguity. Sometimes we don't. Here's where we do not. Mathematics, we do not necessarily want intentional ambiguity. All right, so what starts this? Two tangent Good. Of two. two tangent of x to the 1 times, times derivative of the inside function. Derivative of tangent is secant. secant squared. And I don't think there's anything confusing about that form. Two similar looking problems, but because of when you're doing things to the variable quantity, when you're squaring and when you're taking the tangent, the solutions are very different. So they're not the same function, they're very different functions. They should conceivably then have very different first derivatives. Does the uh, square on the outside of the secret come down as well? Or just what's within the parentheses? Just what's inside of parentheses. So this isn't really you talking about this one? Yeah, should it should that be in parentheses square? You can. You can rewrite that if you choose. But that's 100% equivalent to this. But we're, we're done taking the derivative. The derivative of tangent squared is 2 times tangent to the first times derivative of tangent. That's derivative of tangent, so you're done taking the derivative. And I know what that question is, and I, I've kind of seen and heard that you get in this, this chain rule mindset and you want to continue to take derivatives, but you really only take the derivative one time. Exponent times same inside function to one degree less times the derivative of the inside function, you're done except for any simplification. All right, I think we did some of this um, when we, that day we found the derivative of e to the x as itself, e to the x. We, I think we started that with like 2 to the x and 3 to the x. So this basically ought to work for any of those. We've already used it specifically for y equals e to the x, or any number a that's positive and not equal to 1, uh, what is its derivative? Okay, we had a little extra baggage. Remember, the, what was the extra baggage? Natural log of a. Okay, so we did this. Here, here is a probably a cleaner way now that we have the chain rule to come up with that. So we're going to come up with this result. And this would, I think, serve, if, if you happen to forget this, this would serve as a quick way for you to come up with that, that derivative. So we're going to rewrite a to the x in terms of something else that we know how to take the derivative of using the chain rule. So we're going to use the, um, the fact that the composition of two inverses basically takes you right back where you started. So an example of that would be if you started with x and then you took the square root of x and then you took that value and you squared it. Aren't square root and squaring inverses of each other? Shouldn't you be right back where you started? We started with x and we're ending with x. So we composed a function with its inverse. We took square root, then we squared it, we're right back where we started. If you start with x and you take the natural log of x and then you raise that value, you raise e to that power, because natural log and e to the x are inverses of each other, shouldn't we be back to x? We're composing a function with its inverse. So, e to the natural log of x 
ought to be x. Or in general, e to the natural log of anything ought to be that thing. So whatever you start with, you take the natural log of it, then you raise <laughs> e to that power, you're right back where you started. Another way of looking at this, if you start with x and you raise e to the x, this is actually a little bit easier, then you take the natural log of that. What's the natural log of e to the x? It's x. So again, we composed a function with its inverse. The natural log of e to the x is itself x, or in general. And you, if you ask yourself these questions properly, these are, I call these self-answering questions. When you're taking the natural log of something, aren't you searching for the power you would raise e to get that? Right? So what power would you raise e to get e to the x. Doesn't that answer itself? What power would you raise e to get e to the x? Wouldn't you raise e to the x to get e to the x, right? What's the name of your brother whose name is Bob? Bob, right? Doesn't that question answer itself? <coughs> the same way that this one answers itself. What power would you raise e to get e to the x? You'd raise it to the x power. Same thing up here. What is this exponent? That's the power you'd raise e to get x, and you turn right around and you raise e to that power. What power? The power you raise e to get x. For goodness sakes, you better get x. So you can kind of think through it in terms of what those things actually mean, but in general, you're composing a function with its inverse. So that page is getting cluttered. We want a new name for a to the x. e to the natural log of a to the x. Isn't that the same thing as a to the x? Right? Yeah. So we just wrote on that other page, e to the natural log of u is in fact u. So e to the natural log of a to the x ought to be a to the x. When you have the natural log of a to the x, what can be done with that x? It can actually come out in front in a product form. So there's a new name for a to the x. It's exactly what you were searching for today, right? Another name for a to the x. So if our function is a to the x, we have something that is equal to it. So instead of differentiating a to the x, let's differentiate this version of it. In fact, we just did that with e to the cosine of x, right? What's the derivative of e to some variable power? e to, the e to that same variable <laughs> power times the derivative of that variable power. We just did a problem that was e to the cosine of x. The answer was e to the cosine of x, the answer for its derivative, e to the cosine of x times derivative of cosine of x. Same kind of problem. <coughs> now, isn't natural log of a just a number? a is a number, so it's 2 or 3 or 5. So the natural log of a number is itself a number, right? long as we can find its natural log. So we have some number times x. What's the derivative of some number times x? <coughs> Is that number. <coughs> so e to the x natural log of a, let's see what that's equal to. There's what it's equal to. So for this, I'm going to put in a to the x. And for this stuff out at the end, that's just natural log of a. Is that what we expected to get for this derivative? Right? Derivative of a to the x is a to the x natural log of a. It's just another way. It's a, quite a bit cleaner than what we did the other day. I think the other day we put values of h that were smaller and smaller and smaller into that definition. It 
kind of came up with that. Okay, but this is this is substantially cleaner than that. So here's your shortcut. If you have a problem y equals 10 to the x, base 10 exponential function, then the derivative ought to be what? Natural log of 10. And if you needed to know natural log of 10, you can punch it in on your calculator. 2.3206. Is that right? Am I remembering that number right? 3.3026. 3026. Okay. So you could get a decimal approximation of that if you needed it. Now, does this thing, does this rule work for any base A, any number I want to put in there for A? Should, as long as it's positive and it's not 1. Well, it ought to work for E to the X then, shouldn't it? Let's validate that. Derivative of E to the X ought to be itself E to the X times the natural log of the base. Does that work? Mm -hmm. What's the natural log of E? Mm -hmm. One. So it does give us a, it does work all the time. So not that you're going to use it for e to the x, that's pretty simple, it's its own derivative, but if you want to fall back on that as a generic rule, it does work. All right, now I'm going to challenge you. So if you're having trouble keeping those eyes open, on a Thursday morning, it's kind of rainy. This will wake you up. The sine of the cosine of the tangent of x. Uh, let's track it through. If you were putting a number in, let's say pi over 3 for x, what's the first thing you'd do? You take the tangent of it, right? And then after you found the tangent of x, you'd take the cosine, cosine of that. And lastly, which means kind of outside function, lastly, you take the sine of that whole thing. So the outside function, the, the last function is the sine function. So when you examine this problem, in order to take the derivative of it, shouldn't you see that? Is that what you're doing first? You see the sign of some mass of ink, right? What's the derivative of the sign of some stuff that has variables in it? Cosine. Okay. Derivative would be cosine of that same stuff times the derivative of that stuff. Is that correct? So the outside function is the sine function. So we have, sorry, we have the sine of something. The derivative of the sine of something is the cosine of that same thing times the derivative of that inside function. Is that okay for everybody? <coughs> this is the derivative of the outside function. Chain rule tells us we have to finish that by taking the derivative of the inside function. Not yet. Okay? So since we have three functions, there's going to be, in essence, kind of three chain rules, three derivative processes. So here's the derivative of the outside function. Now we're working our way in. We're not all the way in yet. We're going to take the derivative of, what's the derivative of the cosine of something? <laughs> Negative sine of that same thing times the derivative of that thing. So we've got kind of multiple chain rules stacked <coughs> into end. And you kind of keep going with the chain rule until you get to the, what, inside or innermost function. So here's derivative of the outside function. Here's derivative of the next function as we work our way in. And this is an indicated derivative of the <coughs> innermost function.
and we are at the inside function, so this should be our last piece to the chain rule. Derivative of the tangent of x is secant squared, secant squared x. Is that okay? Probably another rule, another reason why it's called the chain rule is you can kind of chain these things together until you get to the inside function. So we're getting <coughs> kind of a little consistently uglier here with problems. Hopefully the process is coming through and not getting hung up on the multiple trig functions. Questions or issues with that one? <coughs> All right, last example before we look at um, parametric curves, which should finish us up in this section. In fact, jot down, just take a few seconds and jot down what you think the answer is going to be to this comp composed function. <coughs> All right, Casey, tell me what to write down. Cosine of x squared plus x times 2x plus 1 times e to the sine of... Okay, I'm going to write that in reverse order. Okay. okay. <laughs> so tell me what you said last. I'll write that down first. e to the sine of x squared plus x. Okay. Times cosine of x squared plus x times 2x plus 1. Agreement? Mm -hmm. Okay. And order shouldn't matter. It is all a product. What she did was move all that stuff out in front, which is probably a pretty good idea, actually. Is this the derivative of the outside function? Right? Yeah. Derivative of e to a power is what? E, e to that power. same power. So I'm, let me, <coughs> here's the first. kind of generality. We took the derivative of e to a variable power. It's e to that same power. Then we took the derivative of the power. Is that the derivative of the power? It's derivative of the sine of something is the cosine of that same thing. So we did that as the second piece. And this then ought to be the derivative of the innermost function, which is the x squared plus x function, which is 2x plus 1. Is that all right? If you didn't get it, do you understand why you did not have that? Or did everybody get it right? Everybody got it right? Mostly right? All right trying to save a few minutes so we can look at that one web assigned problem, but let's, let's get to this today as well. Everybody's favorite, parametric equations. So we have x defined in terms of t and y defined in terms of t. So there our parameter is t. So x is some function of t, y is some other function of t. So could we, if we have x in terms of t, couldn't we find derivative of x with respect to t? We could. And if we have y in terms of t, couldn't we find derivative of y with respect to t? We could. And we'll do an example in a minute. <coughs> Let's suppose that what we want is derivative of y with respect to x, 
but we don't necessarily want to do the battle of eliminating the parameter and having an equation of y in terms of x. Can we take the pieces that we could readily come up with and somehow do something with them to get this? Multiplying them is not going to work. Let's divide them. Let's take dy over dt, divide it by dx over dt. Does that seem to visually work, right? The, the way the visually is that if you multiplied the top by dt and you multiplied the bottom by dt, it looks like it's going to give us what we want. Right? <coughs> so if you have two... Um, our values of x and y defined in terms of a common parameter, t in this example, you can take their quotient and come up with dy over dx. Now, that's a little different than the chain rule. The chain rule says if you have y in terms of u and u in terms of x, you can multiply those. That's a different scenario. That's y in terms of u, u in terms of x. This is different because we have both of them in terms of t. So we want their quotient this time. Wait, this, is this the thing where you, you, you don't use the quotient rule, you just take no, the derivative of the top and that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. It is not the quotient rule. It's just this <coughs> thing divided by this okay. thing. It's not a quotient rule. So we did a problem earlier using the cycloid, which had these parametric equations. That was the x value. That was the y value. This was the thing that you tracked a point on the outside of a circle as it rolled, so the curve of the cycloid, this point as you rolled that thing around, it did this and was right back where it started and did this. You might want, if that's not, if you're not remembering that, look back to when we did the cycloid. <coughs> I think I actually brought in like a paper plate or something, something circular, and I rolled it and you could track where the point was on the outside, but it, it made this kind of a path. It was cyclic, it repeated every 2 pi. So these are the parametric equations. Just to simplify things, let's let r equal 1. r could be the radius of the circle, but just to make it simpler for this example. So if we want derivative of y with respect to x, we can find derivative of y with respect to theta, theta is our parameter here, over derivative of x with respect to theta. And those should not be that difficult to find. What is derivative of x with respect to theta? Derivative of theta with respect to theta is? One. 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 What's derivative of sine of theta with respect to theta? Cosine theta. Cosine theta. Everybody okay with that? Derivative of y with respect to theta. What's derivative of one with respect to theta? Zero. 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 What's derivative of negative cosine theta with respect to theta? Sine theta. Back to positive, so the derivative of cosine would be negative sine, then negate that. So we could plug those in. Sine theta belongs <coughs> to the numerator. dx over d theta, 1 minus cosine theta. So I realize we don't have an answer in terms of x. Isn't it 1 plus cosine theta? dx over d theta? Why is it? Okay? Derivative of theta would be 1. Derivative mm -hmm. of sine <coughs> of theta would be cosine theta, right? So the minus oh, stays there. Oh, I negative sine right. 
So even though the answer is not in terms of x, let's suppose we wanted to know these things. Could you find where dy over dx was equal to 0? By doing what? Set equal to 0. Right. Set the numerator equal to 0. So where the sine of theta is equal to 0, that causes this whole fraction to be equal to 0, and that whole fraction is dy over dx. Is that all right? Everybody feel confident you could find where the sine of theta is 0? The only reason that you didn't carry over the 1 minus cosine is because it would drop out? Well, if you, this is our derivative. So if you want to make the derivative 0, you make its numerator 0. And I'm going to finish this with this question. What if you wanted to find where the derivative <coughs> is undefined? Where would we pick that off that of this? Right. Now that's when 1 minus cosine is equal to 0. So you make a fraction 0 by making its numerator 0. That does that. You make a fraction undefined by making its denominator 0. That's where we got that. So you'd really want to know where the cosine is 1. So those should be pretty quick and easy. And those are a couple of the kind of lower level applications that we're going to be doing using the derivative. But the important thing is, is if you have x in terms of t and y in terms of t, you can take their quotient and get dy over dx. All right, let's see if we can spend a minute anyway on that um, problem that I put up here earlier. <coughs> this guy. This is a web assign question. Uh, we want to talk about somebody, let me read that. It says, a semicircle with diameter PQ sits on an isosceles triangle PQR to form a region shaped like an ice cream cone, as shown in the figure. If A of theta <laughs> is the area of the semicircle and B of theta is the area of the triangle, find the limit of the quotient of their areas. No, no, it's just once you get something for A of theta, the area up here, and B of theta. But we do want them in terms of theta if we can do that. Uh, B of theta might be the quicker and easier one. Does anybody remember an area function for a triangle in terms of two sides, which happen to be the same, and the included angle? Anybody? One half this mm -hmm. distance. Base times height. Okay, well, it is one half base times height. Everybody's remembering that. So we're talking about B of theta. It is a triangle. So one formula would be 1 half whatever this PR is. PR is the same as PQ. I'll just use them both. PR. Wait, don't you mean PQ? PR uh -huh. and QR. I don't know if I said something different. That's what I want. So one half the product of these two adjoining sides times the sine of their included angle. I don't know if that's something you remember or not, but that's an area of a triangle. Another way you can accomplish this is to split this triangle, and I'm probably going to do this anyway. And if that is theta, then each one of these is half theta, right? Then you could find this distance, right, and this distance in terms of trig functions of the angle half theta. So you've got this right triangle that looks like this. Here's half theta. And let's give this a name. I don't know. Call <coughs> it M for midpoint there. So you could, in terms of PR and PM and MR, you could determine what is this, which is really half of the base, and what is the height 
you could do that in terms of trig function. This is a little bit cleaner. How do you get numbers for those then? Well, it's okay to have things like this in there because you're going to have a quotient and some of those things are going to knock each other out. So then for the top piece, we have to do this, the area. Here's what I would do, and we're running out of time. We are out of time. I would figure out this distance. <clears throat> which is the radius of this circle. And once we get the radius, isn't it half of pi times the radius squared, right? It's a semicircle, so it's half of a circle. The area of the circle should be pi r squared. So it ought to be half of pi r squared. And then figure out what r is. Well, isn't this also r, right? So let's just get an equation that has R in it. R is opposite, right? PR is hypotenuse. So what would that be? Opposite over hypotenuse. Sine? Isn't it true the sine of half theta is R over PR? Is that right? If that's a legitimate equation, what is R equal to that goes in here? Is an R equal to PR? Multiply both sides by PR. So there's a, an equation in terms of theta that would work. And there are others. But you could get started with that in this fashion. You want functions of theta that somehow generate the area. That didn't help you completely, but that's to jumpstart you. See you tomorrow.